uh, with another episode of Quarantined Coaches. And today we got the newest head coach in Division One baseball, uh, Coach Tim Riley at Lafayette. How are you, sir? Great, Great Josh. Josh. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Congratulations. Thanks, Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. I mean, what is this moment like? I, I mean, this is your first head coaching gig, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. It's um, it's pretty it's surreal. surreal. The last couple, couple of weeks have been pretty surreal, surreal with surreal. everything going on. But um, no, no, it was a special, special moment. moment. Kind of get that offer, and realize, realize that. that. Um, really excited, excited to get started. started. What is that process like? Because you were an assistant coach uh, at, at the school already, but it's not that easy, right? I mean, there's there's quite a lengthy process that you have to go through or that the administration goes through, right? Yeah, yeah. actually, um, so Coach Joe Kinney uh, announced that he was going to retire in November. Um, so right away, you know, I had some meetings with uh, our sport administrator and, and our athletic director just to kind of tell him I was interested in the job. Um, and I didn't know it, but a lot of people were reaching out on my behalf um, you know, parents, players, alumni. I think that was, you know, uh, it was a great thing to kind of have been here for a couple of years already to get to know some of the people here. You know, um, I think that's that's kind of the what makes Lafayette so special um, is the people. But it, you know, they wanted to do a search, um, wanted to open it up, and essentially, I kind of knew this. They didn't tell me, but I was now on a job interview for the next few months as we finished out the fall and, and started up the spring. Um, so, you know, we had, uh, we went through a, a, it wasn't really a, a long process. I got a phone call on Monday from our sport admin saying we wanted to meet to talk about the future of the program. And um, our athletic director, Sharita Freeman on Wednesday morning offered me the job, essentially said that after that few month uh, interview process that we all knew what was going on, but nobody said what was going on. Um, that I was, I was their guy, and uh, I would be uh, was was given the opportunity to kind of take over the program. Well, that is uh, that that's awesome, man. You deserve it. Um, I'm I'm sure there's a laundry list of things to do now, right? So, what's at the top of that list? Like, where do you even start? I mean, for me, it'd be like get my desk organized, right? Uh, yeah. but, but then, what 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 comes after? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Um, can't get my desk organized. I can't go back to the office. So um, true, that's, true. it's really been uh, it's really been interesting because, you know, you, when you plan for something like this and you plan for the interview process, you put together your plans, right? Your week, your month, your two months out. Um, and I'm looking at my list of things that I wanted to have done in the first week. And it's tough. It's tough. You're kind of balancing it against, uh, you know, I'd love to have kids on campus and get out and recruit and do things like that. And we can't. So really what I've kind of adjusted my focus to is communication, you know, getting in touch with the team, getting in touch with our incoming guys, um, getting in touch with all the, the strength coaches and the trainers and admissions and all the people that touch the program um, that I have relationships with already, but now that relationship changes a little bit, right? So we are just trying to communicate the best we can and, and set up meetings here and there so that when things get back to normal, we can kind of hit the ground running. Um, this is also, this time that we have is, is a good transition period because I can do some of the tweaking of the fall schedule and, and um, putting together some of the things that take time um, that maybe you wouldn't have time if you were doing all the recruiting and running around. All um, right. That's, those have really been the priorities right off the bat. Um, it's tough because nobody knows what the timeline looks like or what we're working toward, but um, yeah, spent a lot of time on the phone and text, things like that. You definitely won't forget the year that you took over as uh, the head coach, that's for sure, with all this coronavirus stuff going mm -hmm. on, um, making things even more difficult for you. But still excited. You talk about starting to make a little bit of tweaks here and there. Um, obviously, you're going to want to put your own stamp on the program. Uh, what is that going to look like? You know, What are some things that you want to do to – uh, create the kind of culture that that you want to have as the head coach. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, you know, we started to kind of do it already. The ability to have been the recruiting coordinator here for the last couple of years, you know, um, whether you want to or not, you start to recruit kids into your own philosophy of how to do things. Um, so, you know, offensively, when I played, I loved the offenses that kind of played fast. It felt like you were about to be in a nine inning marathon, but it was going to be a sprint at the same time. Um, so this year we started to uh, 
to t kind of take strides toward uh, stealing some bases and, and not even just stealing bases, but going first to third or taking second on a, on a lazy outfielder. Um, you know, I think um, offense is scoring runs when you're not hitting, you know, when you're hitting, we all look like big leaguers and the coaches look like geniuses, right. uh, but how do we score runs when we're not hitting? So, you know, third ball reads, stealing bases, um, good at bats and being able to handle the stick, um, you know, Pitchers, pitchers win more games. I know it's cliche, but you win more games on the mound. If you can keep you in the game into the last three innings, um, it's a big deal. So having a pitching staff that can compete in the zone, get ahead of hitters, you know, some of the things we look for, it's no secret, just two of the first three pitches for strikes and being able to throw an off-speed pitch and hitters counts for strikes. And um, and then, you know, being solid defensively. And I, go, I like to think I'm a little beyond the uh, just make the routine play. I think – we have some guys that can go beyond the routine play and can run some balls down and get to some balls. So um, I really just want to create an atmosphere where these guys love coming to the ballpark every single day. They love working hard. I mean, they already do, uh, but just they have a thirst for knowledge and a thirst for development and just being able to find creative ways to kind of develop that. You know, what, what's special about Lafayette? Um, if I'm a recruit, why should I, you know, go there? Well, you know, what's the selling point to the school? Yeah, um, Lafayette, and I'm going to be a little biased, but it's... Of it's, course, you're supposed to be. This is, I'm setting you up here. Knock it out of the park, coach. It's the best, uh, it's the best education you're going to get. You know, Lafayette's a small liberal arts school. Um, we're located in eastern Pennsylvania, which is just a little bit, about an hour from New York City and, and Philadelphia. So we're sandwiched right in the middle of two of the biggest job markets in the country. Um, you know, the liberal arts education, you're, you're able to, that 10, we have a 10 to 1 student teacher ratio. There's only about 2,500 kids in the school, 2,600 kids. So it's a really tightly knit community. You know your professors, um, you know your classmates, you know, uh, you know, we joke with the, with the staff here, um, other coaches, that it's the only place the soccer coach can walk across campus and say hi to a professor and, you know, they had a, a drink the night before or dinner the night before. So it's a, it's a place where you really know everybody. Um, the people here are, are incredible. You know, I think, I think that's one of the main selling points for the school is when I got here, you know, I, I, I met Joe and I met the administration and kind of their vision, you know, our athletic director, Sharita Freeman got here soon after I got here and just kind of seeing some of the changes and some of the attitude that has come with her. Um, you can just see, I'm really grateful to be a part of this because you can just see the direction that we're going. There's a lot of excitement. Um, but beyond the education, you know, we're, we're kind of selling ourselves as coaches and our ability to develop and um, give you the best opportunity to reach your potential athletically and, and on a baseball field. And then, um, you know, our, we have the best alumni base in the country. One of the first things we did when I got here was we went to a career night in New York City. There were 50, 60 alumni in the uh, New York Athletic Club where they just talked about, they networked with our guys, you know, and right. a panel of guys talking about, you know, their career path from Lafayette baseball to where they are now. And uh, it was cool to just see the tradition and the pride that everybody has um, in this place. And then uh, I'd say the thing that we do the best, we, you know, you never want to guarantee a player anything as far as playing time or, or, right. or anything that has to do with their experience. But, if I had to guarantee something, it's you're going to graduate here with a great career opportunity with a job in hand. You know, my my first year here, we had nine seniors. Six of them had jobs before Christmas, and the other three were going on to graduate school somewhere. And the last two years have been the same numbers. You know, everybody has a plan when they when they graduate, well before they graduate. Um, so that mix of uh, baseball, community, and uh, career development, which is I think why you go to school. Um, you know, I think is, uh, is a great selling point for any high school athlete. So I'm the recruiter. I say, wow, the school sounds amazing, but I'm not so sure about this new head coach. What kind of coach am I getting here? What, what, yeah. what kind of guy am I going to have to deal with out there on the field? He's going to be all over you all the time. No, okay. uh, yeah, <laughs> no, it's, um, you know, I think I've evolved a lot, uh, over time as to what kind of coach I was. I played for Fred Hill at Rutgers and, um, you know, he was he was an old school kind of coach. I think he was he was in his mid seventies when he coached me. Um, so and he was a guy that was throwing batting practice and hitting fungos and you know still doing it all. I hope I'm I hope when I'm seventy five I'm doing all that stuff still. Yeah, 
I got no shot. Yeah, I know. Um, every day it feels like uh, the back goes or something else goes. But, but no, you know, I, I tried to take my coaching style from him, which was, you know, a lot of tough love and uh, in your face all the time. And, and he was really, really hard on us all the time. And I think I, I tried too hard to be him and not myself. And over time, I've kind of evolved into um, not that he wasn't. I mean, he created great relationships, but more of a relationship based um, kind of coach, you know. Well, the times have changed too a lot, right? And how we deal with young players. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we've gotten way past the uh, do it this way because I said so. Um, there's way too many uh, out cell phones. There's way too many cell phones out there is the problem. Cell phones and Twitter and Instagram. Cameras. <laughs> we can learn a lot now, which is good. It's good. It's a good thing. I think it's a good thing that there's so much information at our fingertips and that kids are asking why now. You know, I think a lot of coaches, and I did it early on, it's, it's don't ask me why, do it because I know better. And I learn as much from the kids now as I hope they learn as much from me as I learn from them because it's, they have so much information at their fingertips. And one of the things we look for in recruiting is, do you have a thirst for making yourself better? Do you have a thirst for knowledge? Are you trying to develop yourself? And then we can work together to, to find what best works for you. Right. Um, but that's the kind of coach that I hope they see they're getting is, is somebody that's, that's open to the changing times. Uh, you know, I, I'm really organized and, and I want to have a structure of how we're going to do things, but I'm also very open to ideas and very open to having discussions with the players and the coaches and um, trying to find what works best and not being so, you know, narrow sighted as to there's one way or the highway kind of thing. So you at Rutgers were a catcher. Um, yeah. That is that is the kind of the captain of the field manager out there in a lot of senses. How do you think catching uh, will translate into coaching, or or in, has helped you, you know, become a better coach? Yeah, I think, uh, like you said, you're the captain. You're the you're the quarterback of the team on the field. You have a relationship as a catcher with every coach in the uh, in the system. So. You know all the offensive signs, all the base running signs. You're, you work closely with the hitting coach. You work closely with the defense. You know all of the pickoff signs and bunt defenses and things like that. Um, and then you're the only one that does all of that and then has a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the pitching coach. You know, our old pitching coach here, uh, Greg Dura, uh, he used to say that if you're, you know, he was talking about a pitching coach, but catching is the same way. If you have 15 pitchers on staff, you have 15 different girlfriends, um, 15 different personalities that you have to deal with. Um, and I think, a, yeah, <laughs> that's, you know, as a coach, you have 35 different, uh, personalities that you have to find. It's not about, they have to, you know, work with you. You have to work with them. Um, right. you have to find how to get the most out of them. So I think being a catcher and having your finger on all those aspects of the team as a player, um, definitely helps right away. It helps. You know, when I started, I started as a student assistant coach in 2010 at Rutgers and, um, you know, right away, me being in front of a group of hitters or a group of catchers or. <laughs> we, that's, that's the first, that's the being the head coach, man. But, um, but yeah, no, you know, being able to, to command a group of people right away is um, definitely helps to be a catcher and, and know the ins and outs of all the aspects of the program, but also being able to, to have the communication with those guys. What would you say is the most important thing for a catcher to do to help their pitchers out? Yeah, I think there's a couple things, you know, right off the top of my head. Um, trust, which I think is huge for anybody on the team. But I think the, the catcher gaining trust in the pitcher um, from a physical standpoint, but also um, from a mental standpoint, from a physical standpoint, you know, being able to receive. You know, I've been on both ends of it. I've been a catcher in the bullpen as a player. Um, I've coached catchers for eight years and then pitchers for two years. I've heard the grumblings from the from the mound of this guy's losing me strikes coach or, or, or this right. guy's coach. I really want to throw this guy. Um, so having the trust that when you throw a pitch near the zone, he's going to make it look as good as possible and, and not not butcher, uh, butcher the pitch or take it out of the zone. Um, you know, uh, being able to throw a slider in the dirt with the game-winning run on third base and the, the trust that he's going to block it so you don't leave it over the middle and, and give up that, that game-winning run. Um, I think those things are huge. Um, from the catcher, being a, a servant leader is a, is a word that we use with our catchers a lot. Um, 
you know, being there for the pitcher, not just at practice, but I tell these guys all the time. I mean, they're college kids, right? So I tell them when you're out Friday night or you're out on Saturday night, you guys are hanging out at your apartment or your dorm, um, be there, you know, be, have the pitchers back, you know, be back him up on anything you can so that when you need to kick him in the butt or pat him on the back, whatever he needs during the game, he knows you're there for him. You've had those experiences on and off the field where he has your trust, you're his, you're his leader, and he's going to uh, – it's going to mean a lot more coming from you in game when the, when the pressure's on and your heart beats up that he knows that you have his back uh, all the time. Huh, that is good stuff right there. Uh, that's the one position I would never want to play. Is can't, 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 <laughs> it's the only one I wanted to play. God bless you guys <laughs> who can do that. Um, why is it so difficult? Um, why is the recruiting process difficult for catchers? It's a very special, like you're not going to take, and I'm not saying we necessarily do this, but it happens all the time. If you recruit a shortstop or an infielder, you know, they can play different positions on the infield. There's four. Same thing with an outfielder. You know, if you recruit three center fielders and they all want to play, there's left and right. So you're going to put the best guys out there. For a catcher, there's one guy at a time. And with the skill set that a catcher has, you know, you look at a catcher and um, if you have speed, it's a bonus. You know, if you hit 400, it's a bonus. Um, we really look for a guy who can handle a pitching staff, has that personality, has that confidence, has the attitude to block, has some raw ability behind the plate. And the offensive numbers and the speed numbers and things like that are all bonuses to the position. Um, because of that, and there's only one, I think it's a tough process to, like you said, you bring one in in each class, you've got three or four on the roster. Right. You can't really bring in two in a class or three in a class like you can with an infielder or an outfielder. So once a team fills that positional need, you know, now with that said, a good catcher, if there's, if you're recruiting and, and you're, you're one of those good catchers, they're tough to find. There aren't a lot of really good ones out there that can do, that can have that defensive impact, but also the impact with the bat. So if you can do both, um, I don't think it is a hard process. I think you're going to have a lot of opportunity, but yeah, it's, it's, there's only one on the field. Right. As a, moving. And as a catcher who, who came up and played at the division one level, you know, what would your advice be to, to a high school catcher to make themselves maybe more marketable as a recruit? Should they work out at other positions? I mean, obviously when you're a catcher and you got to catch bullpens and I mean, there's, there's limited time to, to mess around at other positions and, and learn. Yeah. I mean, if you're serious about being a catcher, uh, especially at the division one level, I think um, the, the biggest thing is catch as many bullpens as you can. You know, I think that, um, it, that does not sound fun. It does. No, it's not. It's not. Um, but I'll tell you what, one of my favorite things to do, we had a kid, uh, we have a kid right now who was on rehab assignment. He's going to graduate and, and go on to another school to finish out his eligibility. Um, but I, I would catch his pens when he was uh, getting back to that point where he could, he could throw full. I loved it. You know, I really, uh, you gotta be a little crazy to be a catcher, you know, too. Yeah. Um, but I, I loved it. You know, I loved trying to make pitches look good and approaching the ball a certain way. I think you build that catching strength. You know, you need to be strong in the weight room and it's something we look for, but you can be strong in the weight room. You know, our shortstop's really strong in the weight room. If he had to catch for nine innings, he wouldn't be in catching shape. So I think being able to, to get comfortable in your catching crouch, in your position, in your stance, being able to move quickly and efficiently, um, being able to, in the ninth inning, not look like you've just been through nine innings of baseball down sitting like a catcher. Um, I think that's important. So getting in catching shape, um, the bullpen also gives your pitcher that comfortability with you, that trust that we just talked about. So um, catch as many bullpens as you can, man. And, and when you get the opportunity, take as many swings as you can. Because once you get to college baseball practice, you got to find that time to get your swings in with all the, all the work you do in the bullpen. When you talk about showcase setting and all the metrics that are out there these days, it, it seems like everybody, when it comes to catchers, they just want to throw out their pop time. Yep. Um, and I've heard many people say that's the most overrated metric in the game because it doesn't matter what your pop time is, if it's 10 feet away from the bag or 10 feet over the guy's head or yep. whatever. What, what kind of metrics or, you know, when you evaluate a catcher, if you're going out to watch a game, what are the things that are important for you that you're really looking for? 
Yeah, uh, you know, one of my big, and I kind of, I agree, you know, I think pop time in a showcase setting, there's so many things, if you don't have the video and you can't see what's going on, you know, first thing I do if I'm at a showcase and I'm throwing it is, hey, get down. You know, it, these guys are in a, a half squat, <laughs> yeah, a crow hop to second base. Um, anybody can throw a 1-8 with a crow hop to second base, so... Um, and that's the other thing. I get all these emails. One eight. I'm a one eight. I'm a one seven. The major league average is a, is a two zero. Two zero. Right. Those those are the best guys in the business. So. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, what 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 do these kids need to hear? Because they're all obsessed with getting under that two zero mark. And I mean, you're you're the catching expert and the head coach of a Division one program. Like, what do you want to see? Like, stop sending me that I'm a one eight and send me what. Yeah. So I want to see in game, and it's tough to get video like this, but in game, how do you receive? How do you, you know, what do you look like in your stance? I think as a catching coach and, and as a recruiter, what you're looking for is what, what do you have that's hard to teach? You know, because I have a lot of confidence in myself as, a, as somebody who can develop the catching position. What do you have that's going to take longer to develop um, that other guys might not? So pop time's important, you know, if it's important in game, but we can teach you how to be quicker with your feet and quicker with your exchange. It's hard to teach arm strength. Now we develop it every single day and we have plans for it. But if you have raw arm strength, um, that's that's one of the things I look for. If you have raw arm strength, we'll teach you to do some of that other stuff. You know, if I if I get a video and it's a, it's a two it's a two two, but it's a it's a cannon and it just took them a while to get rid of it and we can clean that up. You know, those are kind of, you know throwing wise. That's what I'm looking for. Um, you know, somebody that has an idea with the glove that can handle the glove being on his hand and, and move it to the ball and how he approaches the ball is what I'm looking for. You know, if you have, it's hard to get somebody out of a brick hand situation. If you have uh, cinder block hands, I think it's it's going to be tough to get out of that. But if you have a good, a good soft glove and you approach the ball in a good way, we can clean some of that up um, to help you steal some more strikes. Um, and then your attitude is one of the things I really look for. Um, you know, do you have the attitude, like I said before, to, to block? You know, do you, do you get down, stick your head in? I get a lot of videos with guys, you know, turning their head back and, and moving away, shying away from the ball. Um, that's important to me. And then the last thing that's really hard to teach, and again, we try to develop it every day, but your flexibility and ability to get in a good stance, because I think that's where it all stems from. You know, your ability to throw, your ability to receive, your ability to block all come from out of your starting point. So if you have really tight hips, really tight hamstrings or, or ankle flexion, and you're not able to start in a really good position, um, and we teach all that again, but the guys that are closer to polished um, in that stance are going to be easier to get to some of those other skills. Um, so your starting stance and the way you get to it, the way you move into it is something that uh, definitely is first on the list. This is certainly going to be a treat uh, for catchers to watch. Awesome content there uh, for them that, that I don't think they get very often. So I appreciate you coming on here. I, I believe you said this was your, your first on-camera interview as a Division I head coach. So I appreciate uh, that a lot, man. I feel honored for that. Best of luck to you and the team this year. Hopefully I see you this summer, Coach. Absolutely, Josh. Looking forward to it, man. Thanks for the opportunity.